My name is Ulrich Crosser, and my topic today are biceps pulley lesions of the shoulder joint. I have no disclosures related to this talk, and I work for the Spital Toga company and the radiology department, the team Radiology Plus. Uh, and we are located in the northeastern part of Switzerland in a beautiful area uh, with the Lake Constance. Before I start uh, this presentation, uh, first I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to speak with such well-renowned MSK specialists in the same session. These are my learning objectives and uh, to achieve them, I picked this table of contents. First, I want to show you that uh, this is not an exotic topic, but quite relevant if you do shoulder imaging. Uh, and uh, then uh, as always in MSK imaging, we have to look at anatomy and variances for the switcher gear and look at the pulley injuries itself. How is that relevant? I did a risk research when I prepared this talk, and uh, I have to admit, I rarely found this pathological entity diagnosed in our reports. And this is, uh, there's a complete uh, discrepancy, uh, because if you look at the arthroscopic surgery data, the surgeons report pulley injuries in 7 to 32 percent of cases. Uh, since the biceps tendon is richly inverted by nerves, it's a considerable cause of morbidity. Uh, this irritation uh, of the LHBD, the long head of the biceps tendon, causes under shoulder pain. And uh, as we will later learn uh, in this presentation, there's some agreement in the literature that uh, the biceps fully injuries are the beginning of a pathological cascade. Therefore, um, early treatment might result in a better clinical outcome. Last, uh, lucky for us, clinical diagnosis is difficult. It's difficult for the clinician to differentiate between different pathological conditions marked in this diagram, the super uh, clinical joint. Uh, and therefore, it is not surprising that the sensitivity with clinical testing, even, even if they combine different tests, is low. Uh, problem for them is they have no specific tests for the pulley system, the specificity reported is uh, the literature is uh, uh, not so bad, but I uh, think it's quite optimistic. If you look at the biceps pulley in the literature, you find a lot of different drawings as in this Google research. For this presentation, I picked this uh, diagram from an ultrasound study because I think it highlights the important parts of the pulley system best. And in this uh, paper, the pulley system can be divided into functional medial pulley complex, consistent with a medial band of the coracohumeral ligament. The coracohumeral ligament is shown here and comes from the lateral part of the coracoid process, and fuses with the superior fibers of the SGHL um, and the subscapularis fibers and attaches to the lesser tuberosity. The lateral band uh, of the pulley complex, on the other hand, fuses with the fibers of the supraspinatus tendon and inserts on the greater tuberosity. Uh, it, there's also contact between the LCHL and the rotator cable, which is uh, also called the humeral semicircular ligament and the structure that connects the supraspinatus and at least the infraspinatus and is there for load distribution uh, uh, across the rotator cuff and therefore for stress shielding becomes important to all the individuals. Please note also that the uh, transverse ligamentous structure uh, above the sulcus bicipital groove is, uh, is not mentioned because uh, this is not a distinct structure. New studies showed that it's just fibers from subscapularis or subtospinatus. Uh, running across there. So how does it look like on MR? And I've shown, I uh, will show this to you in this classic uh, images in, in the literature where you find the SJHL nicely shown over here. And then we have here the coracohumeral ligament coming from the lateral part of the coracoid process. This is the biceps tendon, axial few and sagittal fuse are the most important fuse to look at the biceps pulley system. Here again, we can see the long head of the biceps tendon and in between the subscapularis tendon there's another structure and this is the SGHL which should be seen and a very thick coracohumeral ligament in this patient and above we have the supraspinatus tendon. Least important fuse, the coronal fuse due to the huge variability of the SGHL makes it difficult for us to detect these structures here. This S here's the coracohumeral ligament shown over here. The SGHL is sometimes problematic to detect. Nevertheless, I normally start uh, to look at the shoulder joint with coronal fuse. Um, 
here we see the subscaparostin coracoid process. We go further along in a patient with shoulder pain, we see the cause of the shoulder pain. It's a patient with tendinosis calcarea. This is the supraspinatus. Over here, we go back to the ventral part. We see the attachment of the long head of the biceps tendon, which looks normal. Um, if you go more ventrally, we see there's a small structure coming from the coracoid process. This coracohuma ligament there is uh, a mix up of the SGHL and the MGHL, the middle glenomerular ligament is difficult to differentiate on the coronal fuse. Let's have a closer look on the axial fuse again. We have here the attachment of the long head of the biceps tendon. We go further along, we see that there is more than one structure going uh, to the lateral part uh, here, and the coracohumeral ligament is only on the uh, very thin uh, capsular thickening. Difficult to see, and here is also the MGHL going down at the anterior labrum in a patient with a super uh, labral forearm. Better seen on the sagittal view, we see this variance. Here's the long head of the biceps tendon, and this is uh, two bands of the SGHL, so a normal variance, uh, but this structure is seen, and there is still some place between the long head of the biceps tendon and the subscapularis tendon. Uh, just mention it here, the T1 sagittal view is important to detect fat around the joint capsule. If you don't see it, think of adhesive capsulitis. What about variances? Just want to mention briefly this. Um, uh, missing coracoma ligament is very rare. Patients who have this have normally an, uh, have an abnormality of the pectoralis minor tendon uh, insertion, which is not on the medial part of the coracoid process, but on the joint. And these patients suffer uh, from slap tears and tendinopathy due to the instability of their joint. The SGHL is more problematic, but even here, a completely missing ligament is not described. There are a lot of variations as shown in these images with the MGHL, SGHL, MGHL, SGHL here. The separation is uh, different. It looks different in every patient and we can have two or more bands of it. So a quite variable ligament. Um, if we talk about the biceps solely, we also have to mention structure which is supported by it, namely the long head of the biceps tendon. And I want to uh, show you this interesting study by Florian Book and colleagues that showed that, showed, uh, that uh, uh, if you put the humeral head in a neutral position or external internal rotation, you have a significant influence on the position of the long head of the biceps tendon in the super part of the glenohumeral joint. But this changes are rather small with one to 1.5 millimeter uh, deviation compared to the physiologic range uh, where the long head of the biceps tendon in regard to the deepest part of the bicipital groove can be positioned. So huge variability of, of this tendon as well. And uh, just want to mention, I have not shown any images, but uh, be aware of the magic angle artifact, which manifests as an, an unwanted increase of signal of tendon and silicon elements. If they are placed 55 degrees uh, in relation to the B0 field of the scanner, uh, especially if you use low echo time uh, sequences with an echo time below 34 milliseconds. Um, and uh, here are these uh, images are shown. There's uh, an apnoidic expansion of the supraspinatus tendon and the supranumerary biceps tendon heads, which can both uh, entities can be diagnosed in 20 to 40% uh, of, of uh, cases. Uh, and uh, it's not everything is a split here, so this can be quite uh, often be seen. Um, if we look at the pathological cascade of poly injuries, then um, uh, different traumatas can result in, in an injury, uh, micro traumas or acute trauma with like shoulder dislocation and tears of the rotator cuff. We get an instability of the LHBD and uh, as a result, tendinopathy because this tendon is richly innervated by nerves, as I already mentioned. And due to the tears of the cuff or due to the instability and resulting tears of subscopolis and subspinatus, we can get dislocation of this tendon. Uh, into the joint as shown over here, into the tendon of the subscapularis as shown over here, and extra articular outside if the superficial fibers of the subs uh, subscapularis are torn over here. And especially with the intra 
articular dislocation, we get more injury. We can get, uh, if you imagine you put the arm into intra-rotational adduction, uh, there's an impingement uh, towards the superior part of the labrum, so-called anterior super impingement, and you don't have to be a tennis player, also like swimming with crawling. Uh, this is possible and uh, causes imagery, injury to the labrum. And with this instability, uh, you get uh, bicep chondromalacia as well. So this is cartilage damage uh, of the humeral head. Um, if you look uh, now at uh, the classification, there are different, uh, several classification systems. And I want to mention the Habermeyer classification, which is the most cited one um, uh, by Habermeyer and colleagues. And they described actually uh, lesions uh, to the SGHL uh, in isolation, then it's grade one uh, injury, or in combination with cuff tears, then it's uh, grade two to four. Um, fibers, I don't want to get into details because the same authors just updated the classification system and reported that in 36% of cases actually could not detect an SGHL lesion. Um, nevertheless, this new classification uh, was just recently published, still under debate. And I think um, it shows uh, the, the essential things are pretty similar. If you get more injury to the bully, more instability of the long head of the biceps tendon, you get more injuries to other structures. Uh, as in this study by 2004, they found in 75% uh, grape four uh, instability, they found an anterior super uh, impingement, so lesions to the labrum. They found in 60% in these cases, uh, slap lesions. And please note that uh, even if you have a subluxation of the tendon, you're almost in, in the, almost all patients are affected by cuff pathology. And especially the authors concluded that especially superior articular sided subscapularis tears or and um, anterior subspinatus tears articular sided are always associated with uh, an injury to the pulley system. So we can add, if that's not the initial cause of the uh, instability, we can add slap lesions and cuff pathologies to our pathological cascade as well. How do we can we detect these imaging signs? And what do we have to detect these injuries? Uh, the highest, uh, very high, good uh, sign and very cheap is uh, ultrasound examination uh, combined with clinical testing where you can see the subluxation of the long head of the biceps and out of the bits of the groove uh, together with pain in this region. You can diagnose uh, an uh, injury to the pulley system. And uh, normally we look uh, at um, our arthrographic uh, studies and there we have different signs with a very good sensitivity. And it's clear that uh, arthrography outperforms native MRI. That's, uh, I think, very requisite. And here we see uh, the first sign is the Chandra Brin sign, on, which can be seen on axial and sagittal view. This is the same as biceps chondromalacia due to the instability of the long head of the biceps tendon. You get injury to uh, the, the humor head and the uh, signal alterations over here. This is a sign that there's instability of this tendon and therefore a poly lesion. Below the glenoid, if you measure a distance between the bitipedial groove and the tendon of more than six millimeter, this is a highly specific sign that there is a luxation of the tendon or subluxation uh, and therefore poly injury. The, uh, to detect the subluxation or luxation on axial fluids is actually um, not so easy because I already told you that there's a huge uh, variability, the position of the long head of the biceps tendon uh, in regard to the beta beta groove. In this case, the uh, middle point is luxated uh, over the anterior part of the bitsipal groove, and this is a subluxation. Um, uh, but uh, the interreader agreement or, uh, in studies is reported to be uh, only very fair. D2 sign can only be used if the uh, shoulder joint is in neutral position at uh, 11 to 12 o'clock at the middle part of the glenormal joint. There you have a subluxation of the tendon uh, from its normal course to the anterior. Uh, and, this, and this sign is positive, like uh, dem as demonstrated here. But this is also, has also a low sensitivity and specificity due to the 
normal variations of the cause of the long head of the biceps tensor. More specific is the discontinuous SGHL sign, where um, we can see the signal alterations over here. And uh, this is highly specific if you detect uh, this. Um, the LHBD angle um, can be seen on the coroner view. I don't actually like this sign because it's quite difficult and uh, it's dependent on uh, slice angulation uh, at humor and humoral head uh, positioning. So I find this difficult. This angle is increased. There is uh, probably, this is probably due to a subluxation or luxation of the long head of the biceps tendon. Better is the displacement sign initially described to native MRI. Normally there is all, uh, there's a structure in between the long head of the biceps tendon and the subscapularis fibers. If it's not, if it's missing, similar to the discontinuity, Continuous SGHL sign, then you have an injury to the bullet system and a subluxation. Very sensitive and specific sign, and high, highest and best signs are probably the superior subscapularis tears and anterior supraspinatus tear. They are almost always associated with uh, pulley injuries, and of course, think of pulley injuries if you see tendinopathy or split tears of the LHBD. Let's have a look at at least two cases. Uh, case one, we see a patient uh, with uh, a conservative treatment of supracranial impingement. We look now at the shoulder in the coroner view. We see the attachment of the LHPD is quite nice. There are signal alterations of the subscapularis tendon, and we cannot detect pulley system here uh, on the coroner view. That's affected on the axial view. It's the same. We cannot see the SGHL. We do not have a subluxation. We have not a chandelier brain sign. Uh, actually, the distance is not increased, but if you look on the sagittal view, this is a very good uh, view, and we see the superior uh, lesion of uh, the subscapularis and here a pastal lesion of uh, the anterior supraspinatus. So this is uh, highly associated with pull injuries. Also, we cannot detect an SGHL uh, and we have a displacement sign, direct contact of the biceps tendon with the super part of uh, the uh, subscapularis fibers. So uh, this was a pulley injury and this must be confirmed. It was completely torn, uh, uh, the medial and lateral part of the pulley. In case two, uh, again, we start with the coroner view. Again, this is a patient with a known partial tear. Now we have a full thickness tear uh, of the supraspinatus. It was uh, known that he has a partial, partial tear before. Uh, now full thickness torn. And again, the subscapularis doesn't look very good over here. We cannot detect it on the coroner view very nicely as normal. The insertion of the LHPD looks nice, but uh, here as well, we have problems to detect an SGHL on the axial view, it's the same. We have no uh, luxation actually of the long head of the biceps uh, tendon, but the SGHL is somehow missing, not normally seen. The coracohumal ligament is uh, very, very thin shown here. Um, so difficult to see. We have an uh, increased instance here uh, of, of the tendon. Uh, it uh, was more than six millimeters. And if you look now on the sagittal view, we only, uh, also have the positive uh, chondral brin sign. We have here edema, which is probably better seen on the T1 weighted images, where we have here edema. And we have a displacement sign and discontinuous SGHL, which is uh, missing over here. And uh, these typical the tears of the supraspinatus and subscapularis, and this was also a poly system injury. And at one, uh, in, in conclusion, I want to uh, say that I uh, hope you, uh, that you have a closer look at uh, biceps poly because they are common. And in some patients, at least they are the beginning of a pathological cascade and think of different image designs, especially if you see super articular sided subscapularis tears and or anterior articular sided supraspinatus tears of an injury to the belly poly system. If you want to uh, have a look, a closer look at this uh, talk, you can also uh, look up our uh, webpage and uh, see this presentation and the recording of this talk. Thank you very much.